Hi there, everybody. Welcome back to another online lecture for organic chemistry as part of the Chem Complete series. And we are continuing our organic chemistry 2 lecture today. And we're going to break into a new topic, which is ethers. So for ethers, we just finished alcohols. Ethers take the common form R O R, where again, R is the rest of the molecule. So we're really looking at two hydrocarbon chains that are attached with an oxygen in the middle. Ethers are fairly common functional groups, particularly as solvents. And one of the reasons we use ethers as solvents so often is because they are usually unreactive towards many other organic chemistry reagents that we come across. There is one type of reagent that a ether is susceptible to in terms of a ether cleavage, and that is a strong acid. We're going to take a look at those a little later on. But in general, ethers are not going to behave or interact with most chemical reagents, and therefore they make ideal solvents because you really want to pick out a solvent that's not going to be um, encouraging or interacting with side reactions of any sort. So some of the most common ethers, uh, when you hear ether mentioned in the lab, so let's say that you're in organic chemistry lab and they talk about using ether as a solvent. The ether used as a solvent is typically diethyl ether, okay? And this comes from, and we'll, we're going to talk about naming ethers in just a minute. This comes from the fact that there are two ethyl groups on each side of the ether compound. So diethyl means there's a ethyl group here, and then there's another one over here. So diethyl ether. Very common solvent. Uh, excellent solvent, but you have to be careful because ethers in general, as a class of compounds, have very, very high flammability. And so you have to be very careful around open flames or even hot plates uh, when you have those hot vapors sitting around. So another very common one that students will see is THF. This sometimes appears in the boron trihydride reaction from Organic Chemistry 1. And THF is a five-membered ether ring, just like this. It's a cyclic ether. We are going to talk about a specific class of cyclic ethers later on known as epoxides. And epoxides, which you've hopefully been exposed to somewhere, are three-membered rings. So an epoxide would look like I've got an R group, here's a carbon, I've got an oxygen, attached to these two carbons, right? And here's another R group. So this right here would be an epoxide. It's going to be a three-membered ring when I'm dealing with epoxides. The epoxide group is a very special type of ether group. It's highly reactive in comparison to most ethers, and that's because of the angle strain. So when you take a look at the 60-degree angle strain involved with the epoxide, three-membered ether rings are going to be very, very reactive in comparison to something like a five-membered ether ring like we have here with tetrahydrofuran, the THF. And that's because the bond angles are very stable. Uh, they're optimal and ideal in this five-membered ring, so we really don't have uh, that much to worry about. So that gives you a general background on ethers. Um, very useful functional group, but also kind of a boring functional group. Most students, when they go through the ether chapter, it's kind of over very quick all of a sudden because there, there's not a whole lot of reactions. The epoxides have some reactions, but ethers, when you have an ether, there's literally one reaction that ethers can undergo. We're not going to have a huge plethora of reaction like we did for the alcohols. So just keep that in mind. Now, naming ethers. Um, we've been used to naming things. We've done alkenes, alkynes, alcohols. Naming ethers is going to be a little bit different than what we're used to. So when we get ready to name an ether, there's actually two different methods. So the first thing we're going to discuss is method one, and then we'll talk about method two in just a minute. So for method one, it's going to be when the ether is the only functional group. Okay, so if the ether is the only, and I'm going to abbreviate here, functional group, then this is the naming methodology we're going to use. If there is another functional group, for instance, an alcohol or an alkene or something of that nature, then this naming system sort of is set aside and we use a different naming system, which will be method two. So for method one, the only thing that you need to do is you're going to name both sides of the ether in alphabetical order. That's it. Name both sides of the ether in alphabetical order. So what do I mean by that? Well, Let's look at an example here. So here's a very simple ether, okay? 
I take the oxygen, that's the middle of the ether functional group, and I look at what's on each side. Well, on this side, I have a methyl, and on this side, I have an ethyl. And that's all I need. So just like I had diethyl ether, I would name this E would come before M. So when I get ready to name this ether, I'm going to call this ethyl methyl ether. And that's all I have to say for the name. So it's actually, I find it to be an easier way of naming than going through and having to do the, the classic IUPAC system where we're doing the longest chain and the numbering. That's going to come back in method two, so don't forget about that. But this method is a little bit easier when we're working with this. So I'll give you guys another one, slightly more complicated example, but you should be able to get it. All right, so what if I have an ether like this? So this ether, I'm going to say, all right, here's the oxygen in the middle. So these groups here are what I need to concern myself with. So what is this group? Well, this is a benzene ring. When I have a benzene ring, I'm not going to label it as benzene. The proper um, sort of substituent name for a benzene is phenol. And do not confuse this with phenol. Okay, Phenol is a benzene ring acting as a substituent. Now notice the spelling, phenol with an O-L at the end is a benzene ring that has an alcohol group attached to it. And we talked about that in the alcohol chapter. We're also going to see it appear in the aromatic chapter. Now, this up here, just like before, is an ethyl group. So if I wanted to name this compound, I would say, okay, well, E comes before P. So I'm going to have ethyl phenyl ether. And that would be the name of that compound. So to give you one more, let's say that this was my compound. Okay, so this one down here, if I take a look at this, this side I've got a methyl, and this side I have a T-butyl substituent. Now, I don't know if you remember way back when, uh, in terms of naming in Organic Chemistry 1, the T, okay, meaning tetra, is not utilized in the naming system. So we really prioritize the B here. That is where we're going to look at the alphab uh, alphabetizing here. So when we list this, it's going to be T-butyl, because we're really viewing that B is coming before the T, okay, T-butyl, methyl, ether. All right, so make sure you practice some of these. Any good textbook should have some. These are very simple to name when the ether is the only functional group there. And you can get larger. Um, so you can have a, you know, methyl pentyl ether if I have a five-membered carbon chain on one side. Um, so don't think that the size is necessarily a limiting factor there. If the ether is the only functional group, then that's the way uh, it's handled. So method two, all right, which we sort of mentioned a second ago, is when other functional groups besides the ether are present. So if I have other functional groups besides ether present, then I am going to say, all right, now I need to use this other naming system. I can't just do sort of the slice and dice down the middle of the ether. So to give you an example of something like this, all right, All right, let's see. We'll put an alcohol here because that's a non-ether functional group. And then we'll toss on this group here. So the way in which we go about naming compounds, if there are other functional groups besides ethers, is that we are going to name them as a alkoxy, as an alkoxy substituent. All right, so for instance, methoxy. Okay, I would say something is a methoxy, so maybe 2-methoxy, 3-methoxy, ethoxy, phenoxy, so on and so forth. That would be the phenyl, all right? So we're going to name it as an alkoxy substituent. I'm no longer concerned about the ether being placed in the main chain. It can be a substituent. In fact, it should be a substituent coming off of that chain. So now I go back to my normal rules. I say, where's the longest chain containing the alcohol? It's this one running 
directly perpendicular to the methoxy group. And I want to prioritize, go back to the other rules, I want to prioritize my alcohol. So I would say one right here, right? And then I would continue two, three, four, five. Because remember, it's the longest chain with the alcohol getting the priority is the naming rule. We're basically falling back onto naming alcohols here. So what I would say is, all right, if that's a five-member chain, that's going to be a pent and all. Pent for five, and then this is our alcohol with the OL at the end. I want to make sure I put one because I'm specifying where the alcohol group is located. And then I would say, all right, well, where is this group and what would I call this group that's sitting up here? Well, there's only a CH3 attached to it, so it's going to be a methoxy. And it's in position two, so I would say that this is two methoxy, one pentanol. So hopefully that makes sense. You're, you're again, naming the main functional group outside of the ether, and the ether is taking the place as a substituent in this case. So I'm going to go ahead, I'm going to put one more up. I want you to try to practice it. So I encourage you to pause the video, see if you can name it, and then I will come back and I will walk through uh, how to name this. So let me go ahead and draw the structure up there. You should copy it down so you can work with it. So here's our structure. All right, that's the main ether portion. And we're going to say, all right, let's put an alkene in here all right so here's the structure you need to name this structure using proper IUPAC rules and remember because an alkene is present right the alkene is another type of functional group you should name it according to alkenes and then do a, a uh, alkoxy substituent at the end so give it a shot keep stereochemistry in mind and unpause the video when you're ready and we will continue All right, guys, welcome back. Hopefully you were able to solve that. So when we are working with this, we need to consider that the alkene is our priority at this point, as we discussed. And so when we get ready to name this alkene, we have to find the longest carbon chain that is going to contain the alkene here. And so if I take a look at this structure, I can say, all right, the longest alkene chain should be a pentene, right? Because I have one, two, three three, four, don't forget this carbon over here, five, right? Now, that may not be the optimal numbering system, and in fact, it's not, because I was just pointing out the longest carbon chain. If I look here, all right, remember, it's the first area that the double bond basically takes part in this chain. So here, it would be a three pentene, whereas if I number it the other way, meaning one, two, three stays there, four, and five well now i have a two as the priority and that's correct because we want to give the lowest priority possible to the double bond so this would be a two pentene make sure you get the ene in there as the root okay now one thing i told you to look out for to remember is the fact we're going to have stereochemistry so if you look at the stereochemistry here we're going to be using ez terminology this is not cis trans because we have more than two r groups or non-hydrogen groups present so hopefully if you were assessing this you found out that this compound was e in its stereochemistry and we will place that at the beginning of this name once we finish everything to specify the uh, positioning of the compound and that is really because we have this large group here and this large group here they're opposites of one another when we're dealing with this okay so that's e if you forget that go back and review when we were doing naming of alkenes and stereochemistry of alkenes so hold that off to the side we're going to plug that in at the beginning the other thing we need to deal with now are the substituents so if i redraw this here which i will do because i'm sort of trashing the one up there with my chicken scratch right so we had this this and this so we said here is the main chain which I'm circling here so then what are the substituents well I have a methyl group that's here and this group right here is going to be hopefully you found out a ethoxy group when I'm working with this okay oh wait a minute a methoxy, I'm sorry, it's a methoxy group. 
Yes, because there's just the one methyl group here when I'm dealing with this. So as I would continue, I would say, all right, well, the numbering system is one, two, three, four, five. So I have a methyl, think about alph alphabetically here, and then I also have a methoxy, right? Methoxy and methyl. And it's going to be a 3-methyl, and it's going to be a 2-methoxy when I'm looking at that. Well, they both have meth. Then I have Y versus O. The O comes first, alphabetically speaking. So it's going to be 2-methoxy. three methyl and then before all of this we should have E to classify the stereochemistry so a bit of a mouthful E2 methoxy 3 methyl 2 pentene is the proper name for this structure that we've drawn out so hopefully you were able to get that again go back and review your IUPAC naming rules if you're having trouble the real point here is to highlight excuse me to highlight the alkoxy substituent naming method when there is another functional group present such as an alkene, an alcohol, uh, an alkyne, a carboxylic acid, any other type of functional group. So hopefully you guys found this introduction useful on ethers and naming ethers and I will see you guys for the next lesson where we will start discussing how to create ethers. We're going to kick off with the well-known reaction, the Williamson ether synthesis. So I will see you guys for the next video. Please remember to leave comments. If you have any questions, I'm happy to get back to you. And I would greatly appreciate a like or a subscription. If you find the content useful, you will get constant updates for anything that comes to my channel. So thank you guys a lot, and I will see you in the next video.